Hello, and welcome to my webinar, Changing Eating Behaviors in Your Family. I'm Dr. Leticia Hardy. I'm a general pediatrician that specializes in obesity medicine. I'm a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics and a diplomat of the American Board of Pediatrics. I developed a passion for obesity medicine early in my career, and this webinar and future webinars aim to facilitate change in one person can lead to change in one family, which can eventually lead, lead to global change. I do have to state a liability clause, which is this webinar is for educational purposes only and should not replace the care of your primary physician. So here is an overview of what we'll talk about. First, I'm going to go into the obesity epidemic, then family history. We will take a look at a growth chart. We will look at body systems affected by obesity, and then I'll discuss the healthy plate and portion sizes. So the childhood obesity epidemic. The prevalence of childhood obesity has been on the rise since the 1960s, then it plateaued for several years, and now it continues to spike again since 2009. The rates are seen more commonly in African-American girls, Hispanic boys, and those who are living in poverty. So despite all the efforts to combat obesity, rates continue to rise. This is most likely due to the increased consumption of processed foods and sugar. There are many studies that show that sugar is more addictive than cocaine. So when you see a child in the grocery store screaming for their sugar-coated breakfast cereal, there may be an actual addiction playing a role in this tantrum. There is also a good book about it. It's called Salt, Sugar, Fat, and it discusses the laboratories of the food industry and what they do to figure out the bliss point before selling their product. And basically, the bliss point is elicited by getting children to taste a variety of foods with increasing amounts of sugar. And then when the child is at a point where they love it, they will call that amount of sugar and the effect that it has on the child the bliss point. And so they will test their foods for the, this bliss point so they can sell them to the consumer. So like I said, this epidemic has increased with increased societies of society's intake of processed food. Um, our lifestyles have become busier, so it's easier to buy processed foods. Um, it's convenient. It's easier to cook, shorter time to cook. Um, you can store it for a long time. So we've become a society that is highly dependent on processed foods. So let's talk about the influence of genetics on your family's risk of developing obesity. If one parent is obese, there's a 50% chance that your child will be obese. If two parents are obese, there's an 80% chance. And if one sibling is obese, there's a 35 to 40% chance. Also, if certain diseases run in your family, your children are more likely to become, to become obese and have them as well, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, thyroid disease, and cancer. So let's look at a growth chart. Many of you have probably seen growth charts before when you take your child to the pediatrician. And this example is a growth chart of a girl. They have girl growth charts and boy growth charts. At the x-axis, or at the bottom, where you see my mouth, mouse moving, you'll see age. So two, three, four years of age, all the way up to 20 years of age. On the y-axis, you'll see weight and stature. So these group of curves at the bottom, clustered together, are the weight percentile curves. And at the top are the height percentile curves. So in this example, we see a girl who was starting to follow one of these curves, the line right above the red line, tracking beautifully because you want to follow one of these lines. And then at five years old, she started to jump at six, jump up again at seven years old, eight, and she just keeps going. And she's above the top line here, which is the 95th percentile. So she's way above the 95th percentile for weight. Also during that same time, around five, she started to slowly cross the percentiles for her height. And now her height is above the 95th percentile. In this example, 
shows a typical pattern that I see in clinic, which is due to what we call exogenous obesity, meaning that you're gaining weight from overeating, from calories, not from some genetic problem. So usually kids who are tall and overweight usually are just eating too much. But if you're short, very short and overweight, it could be an actual medical condition such as hypothyroidism. So body systems affected by obesity. This slide shows the many organ systems affected and many may not even realize that these changes are happening in their bodies. So we'll look at a general overview. H-E-E-N-T stands for head, eyes, ears, nose, and throat, heart, lungs, abdomen, musculoskeletal, skin, and the endocrine system. So on my webinar advertisements, it states that I would give you a step-by-step -step approach to change the eating behaviors in your family. So anytime you see the green footprints, like the one on this slide, you should write down the steps that I will discuss in the subsequent slides. So I will go through different body systems and I would like you to write down a list of things to look for in your child. So the slide on the left shows a picture of a boy who no longer finds pleasure in doing things that he used to. So he's looking out the window instead of playing outside. Uh, this is called anhedonia, and this can be a sign of depression. Uh, the slide on the right shows a tape measure. Sometimes in obesity, we can see weight gain or even weight loss. So if your child is suddenly losing weight and continues to eat the same or more than normal, this can be a sign of a new onset diabetic. So on your list, you should be writing sad, anhedonia, meaning not wanting to do things that you used to, um, isolating oneself, um, also write down recent rapid weight gain or weight loss despite still eating a lot. The next slide shows a woman with a headache. So you can end up having lots of headaches, visual, visual disturbance, personality changes. You can end up feeling dizzy, have some memory loss, and these are all consequences or what we would call comorbidities of being overweight or obese. Your child may present with chest pain, palpitations. There may be difficulty breathing, shortness of breath with mild exertion. You may have worsening or new onset acid reflux, abdominal pain, bloating. It's very common to have muscular aches and pains as well as joint pain. Um, obese individuals tend to complain of back, hip, and knee pain the most. So if a child is complaining about musculoskeletal pain, especially hip or knee pain, this problem or complaint needs to be taken seriously. They can have something called skiffy or avascular necrosis of the femoral head, which are emergencies. They can also end up having bedwetting or waking at night to go pee or even incontinence during the day and end up wearing a pad like this during the day. I have had a patient who was about nine years old about 240 pounds, and he had urinary incontinence. He had sleep apnea, which I don't go into on this webinar because I feel like that's an, a webinar all by itself. Um, he pretty much was like an old man in a child's body, and it was pretty sad. So if your child is starting to have bedwetting when they didn't have it before, or when they laugh, you know, they're dribbling urine into their underwear, um, they may they may need um, an apnea machine or um, they may be in the beginning stages of diabetes. So skin, this is a very common finding in insulin resistance where the neck looks dirty. Um, the mother 
or a father will come to me complaining that the child's neck looks dirty and they keep cleaning it, but it doesn't come off. And so um, I tell them this is a sign of prediabetes, a sign of insulin resistance. Um, the fancy word for this is called acanthosis nigricans. And when a child has this, we need to get them to lose weight ASAP. If not, they will become a diabetic. The next thing we'll talk about is hormone changes. If your child has heat or cold intolerance, which means your child's always hot when everybody else is cold, or your child is always cold when everyone else is hot, um, if they're showing excessive thirst or urination, um, especially girls with increased facial hair or lower back hair, or they start with irregular periods or never had a regular period. Um, this can be signs of hormone changes of, because of their obesity. So this picture is just showing someone who's really hairy and they may not have had that much hair before. So who does the grocery shopping? Whoever does the grocery shopping, this person is responsible for the family's home health. So in other words, you may not have control of what your family eats outside of the home, but you can certainly take control of what's in the refrigerator and the pantry. I usually recommend that the grocery shopper shop alone so there are no distractions or tantrums for things. Um, I also recommend trying to work your way through the outer margins of the grocery store where the fruits, vegetables, and dairy are. Um, and try to avoid the middle aisles where most of the processed foods are. So here are my little footprints. Um, so the next step will be to do a kitchen pantry checklist. After the webinar, you will all receive an email and an attachment of a template that you can fill in. Uh, the template will have some columns where you can fill in the different variety of foods and beverages um, that you have in your home. And then this will get you to see the big picture of the inventory that you have in your home. Um, it will get you to a starting point on where you need to start making changes. You may not even realize how much processed food you have until you put it all down on paper. So here is a picture of the healthy plate. We do recommend that you start serving yourself and your families the healthy plate. And basically, I'm gonna move my mouse. You want to split your plate in half with an invisible line that is. And on one half of the plate, you want all fruit or all vegetables or a combination of both. Technically, technically it should be a combination of both, but sometimes your child may want one or the other and that's fine. And then the second half of the plate, you wanna split into two again and put meat and your whole grain. I usually tell parents the meat should fit the quarter of the plate. So you shouldn't stack meat and make a, a mound. It should actually be one piece of meat or two smaller pieces that can fit in this section. Here's another example of a healthy plate. If you just imagine there's your fruit and vegetables, that would be one half of the plate. And then the other half of the plate split in two with your meat and your grain. So here are the little footprints, and I'm going to send you all a portion size checklist. It will have a list of ages as well as the portion sizes that they should be having. So if your child's five years old, you'll go on the column, find five years old, and it will tell you the size of the meat they should have, the portion size of the vegetable, etc. However, if you don't want to do that, and most families don't have time to measure things or weigh food, you can just think of the healthy plate, and that will give you a great summary of how to feed your child and what portion size you should feed your child. So let's just recap before I say some final words. Remember, the first thing I want you to do is make an assessment of the physical findings 
in your child. You want to look over all those body systems that I talked about. Look at their skin. Look behind their neck. You know, ask them if their knees hurt, their hips hurt. You know, look at all the things that we talked about, shortness of breath, and write down those things. And see if there's a problem, especially if there's more than one system affected. The next step, I want you to go into your kitchen pantry and do that inventory. I want you to go in your refrigerator and do that inventory and write down all the foods that you have in your house and those columns. The inventory will have like meat in one column, you know, fruits and vegetables in another column, sweet and sugared, um, sugar sweetened beverages in another column. And then you're going to look at it and decide where you're going to start making changes. Um, I personally tell parents to pick a day on the calendar where they're going to just throw out all the junk food, not let your children know about it. Don't take them with you grocery shopping and just start over and have healthy snacks in the home. Um, you know, you have your, your meats and vegetables and then, you know, even less um, sugar sweetened beverages, have more water in the fridge and just do it without saying anything. And then when you serve their um, dinner, the next step I want you to use is that healthy plate model and portion sizes. Okay, and you'll receive those as an attachment. But, you know, sometimes the healthy plate can be really difficult for families because some children eat significantly larger portions than the healthy plate. They go for second and third servings. So what you would want to do is to gradually give them less and less food without them knowing so if you normally put, you know, two big spoons of rice on their plate, um, you might go down to one and a half. The next week, go down to one until, you know, you gradually get them to the healthy plate size that you want. I've definitely have done that to a family member. They had no idea I was decreasing the portions on their plate until one day they said that <laughs> they still feel hungry. And I knew I've like reached the point where I couldn't go down anymore. And I started just to give a little bit more, but they had significantly decreased the amount of food they were eating. They didn't know it and they weren't hungry. So what else? Um, I also recommend cooking just enough food. So this limits the temptation of second servings. And if you do have extra food, food to freeze anything that's left over. So, you know, they won't go back and try to like reheat frozen food or they may not want to wait several hours for something to thaw out. So it limits what they're snacking on or if they're old enough, you know, to wake up in the middle of the night and go in the fridge and eat, just have healthy um, options in the refrigerator. I always say if, there are potato chips and apples as snack and snacks in the house. Which one would you pick? Obviously, most people would pick the chips. So, but if they're apples and oranges, well, they're only healthy options. So your child can go in the refrigerator in the middle of the night and decide to get an apple or an orange instead of junk food. So just looking at the slide, I put my website here. You can take a look at some of the things that we do. Um, the website stepuppawc.com. It stands for Step Up Pediatric and Adolescent Wellness Center. And if this webinar was useful to you, you can definitely donate anything that you would like that you feel is warranted for this webinar. Um, there'll be a link for a donation, or you can go to the website and there's a donate button there. All donations are appreciated. They go back into um, the nonprofit. It's a nonprofit organization, so I cannot use the money for myself. It can only go back into the cause of the organization. And you all will also um, 